chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that we are able to gather here simply by grace. We ask that you will speak to us. We ask that you will reveal your will for our lives. We pray for your servant and his family as they are traveling. We pray for your mercies with them and success for all the things that they are waiting upon. We commit our time before you. Holy Spirit, come and minister to us. We ask this in your precious name. Godly families, that is our theme for this year, building godly families, becoming godly families. Godly families and the local church, they go together. It is in the context of a local church that godly families are produced. And godly families, in turn, they build the local church. In Joshua 24 and verse 15, we read the words of a man who was the head of a godly family. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is a verse that is very familiar to all of us. At least for this month, it will be hanging on the walls of some of our homes. These are words of passion, but these are not words of a young man who is merely driven by passion. These are the words of an old man who grew wiser as the days went by. In Joshua chapter 24 and verse 29, we read that Joshua was 110 years old. He is giving his final goodbye to his people. He is addressing them one last time. And he is looking back at what God has done for him. In his late 80s, he led the Israelites in conquering the land of Canaan for seven years He fought faithfully. He has seen God deliver faithfully his people time and again. He was born in the brick fields in Egypt. In Egypt, his name was Hosea, which means salvation or deliverance. But later on, as he saw the goodness of God in his life, his name was changed to Yehoshua, meaning Yahweh is my deliverer. He has seen success after success, from crossing the Red Sea, to crossing the Jordan, to conquering Canaan. He has seen the hand of God. And as he bids goodbye to his people, he acknowledges that there are external threats to the people of Israel. But in this verse, he acknowledges that some of the threats that the Israelites will face is from themselves. Because they will choose to be disloyal to the God who brought them out of Egypt. He knew these people very well. He knew that they were fickle in their faith and in their commitment to God. He knew that they were still worldly and that they were prone to follow other gods. And Joshua wants to bring them to a fresh encounter 
with God. And this is the reason why he puts this choice before them. Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. In verse 14, he begins by saying, now, therefore. In fact, this is how the book of Joshua begins. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore. When God calls us to serve him, it is in the context of what he is already doing. How we serve him today will determine the course of history. Godly families will produce godly leaders who will then lead other godly families. The question before us is, what kind of leaders are we producing? What will be the character of the generation that will succeed us? The choices of one generation will determine the character of the next. Joshua lays out a very simple message. It is a clear message. Godly families will serve God. And so this morning, I would like you to take you through the life of Joshua, and I would ask you to focus on three things. The focus of our service the means of our service, and the reason for our service. Firstly, the focus of our service. Why is it that God calls us as families to serve him? All of us deal with children one way or the other. And at some point we must ask, why has God given us these children into our lives? Was it just an accident that these particular children should be in our lives? We must remember that the children that God has given us, they are a gift from God. They truly do not belong to us. We don't have a claim to ownership over them. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, this is Paul's admonition. Fathers, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Why? Because they belong to the Lord. That child that God has placed into your lives is not an accident. It is a significant responsibility for which you and I will be held accountable. But the question is, do we care? This is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote. The righteous man is the one who lives for the next generation. In Israel's history, we will read about many parents who failed. But I want you to look at particularly at a king who did not care for the next generation generation. A few verses. Will you turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 16 through 19. This is a conversation between a prophet Isaiah and the king Hezekiah. Verse 16, it says, then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Some of your sons who shall issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away, and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. Notice how Hezekiah responded, verse 19. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good, for he thought, Is it not so, if there will be peace and truth in my days? Isaiah has just announced that the next generation will be handed over to the enemy, and Hezekiah's response is, 
The word which you have spoken is good. That's what he's told the prophet. But inside of him, he had a thought. Will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? We see a king who is only concerned about his own comfort. He has no vision for the future. He has just been informed that the enemy will take captive his sons. And his response is, that is all right as long as my time is peaceful. Is this how we view our lives? As long as there is peace and prosperity in our times, we will not bother about the next generation. In the previous verses in, the, in this chapter, from verses 12 to 15, Hezekiah has entertained some visitors from Babylon. And he has shown to those visitors how famous he is. But he had no concern for the next generation. In what kind of a generation did he produce? Chapter 21, verse 2. Manasseh did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. Verse 16, we read, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood. Hezekiah should have known better. He knew the value of prayer. When he was sick, he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord healed him. The Lord gave him 15 more years in his life. And as a sign, the Lord turned back the sun 10 degrees. He had tears to shed for his own life, but he had none to shed for the next generation. It is good to pray for our needs, our material needs but we will be held accountable for how we raised the next generation. What good is worldly accomplishment if the next generation is lost? And throughout scripture, we see evidences of people who neglected the next generation. Eli was a high priest who failed to raise his sons well and God rejected him, and God brought Samuel. This was the Lord's question to Eli, First Samuel chapter 2 and verse 29. Why do you honor your sons above me? Why do you honor your sons above me? If we honor our children more than we honor God, we will reap the consequences. Samuel became the prophet, but he neglected the raising up of his sons. And then Saul became king. When Saul displeased God, David was made king. When we honor our children more than we honor God, God will reject them and he will bring others. Catherine Booth, the wife of William Booth, the founder of Salvation Army, this was her prayer. God, I will not stand before thee without all my children. Is this our prayer when we think about our children? God, I will not stand before you without all of my children. The focus of our service to God is to bring up a generation that knows him. But how do we do this? And for this, we'll come back to the life of Joshua. And I want to show you a few things that influenced his devotion to God. You see, when Joshua 
at a 110-year-old end of his life, places a demand before the people. He is asking them to make a big decision because he knows that this is the biggest decision of their lives. This one decision will guide all the other decisions that they will make. This one big decision will keep them from making many other little decisions. And so Joshua was prepared by God through his circumstances. He served God. The big reason why Joshua ended up the way he did was because there was a Moses in his life. God will use the Moseses of one generation to bring up the Joshuas of the next generation. I want to highlight before you at least three ways in which Moses influenced Joshua. Firstly, Joshua chose the presence of God over the company of man. Will you turn with me to Exodus chapter 33 and verse 7? Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, a good distance from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Verse 9. Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. Verse 11. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses returned to his camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Joshua is mentioned as a young man, and he will not depart from the tent of meeting. Genuine worship in one generation will raise up genuine worshipers from the next generation. We can come up with all kinds of plans, but if our devotion and our service and our worship is not genuine, the next generation will be lost. Moses is surrounded by 600,000 people. But for him, the presence of one being is far more important than the men and women around him. And so Moses engages in this back and forth with God. And in verse 16, he says, How then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight? I and your people, is it not by our going, by your going with us? Moses has come to conclude that all that matters in his life is the presence of God. If you and I want to raise up the next generation of Joshua's, we must earnestly seek the presence of God above all things. Whether we know it or not, Joshua's are watching us. They are observing our worship and they are watching if our worship is genuine. Joshua has seen Moses speak to God face to face and Joshua wants the same encounter with God. Parents, do you have a regular appointment with God? Do you meet with him regularly where you speak to him face to face? If you do that, your Joshua will show up. Man of God, woman of God, 
If your Josh Joshua is not showing up, you spend time in that tent of meeting with God. God will bring your Joshua to the entrance of that tent. Throughout scripture, we see how one generation was influenced by the passion of the previous generation. Elisha observed what Elijah had and he said, I want double portion of his spirit. It is when the disciples watched the Lord Jesus pray that they went to him and asked him, teach us also to pray. As we genuinely seek God and his presence, God will raise up the Joshua's of the next generation. Where will they learn how to worship God, how to pray to God, if not from us? And so I have a suggestion. When the church gathers together, don't send the children away. We will be meeting for prayer. I have seen how when the prayer begins, sometimes we just send the children out to play. They need to see their parents pray. They need to see their parents worship God. We sometimes think our children are too young for these things. Joshua is a young man and he wants to know God simply because of the worship of one man. We are responsible for how these children will turn out to be seeking the presence of God, genuinely seeking the presence of God. So this morning, will we be able to say, as for me and my house, I will seek the presence of God. The second way in which Moses influenced Joshua was that Joshua chose the word of God above the wisdom of man. Will you turn to Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8? This was the instruction that he heard from the Lord. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. He has heard directly from God that his success and his prosperity will be defined by his submission to the word of God. The biblical mandate is that families hear and study God's word together. You know, we don't have time. If I had time, I would have pointed you to Nehemiah chapter 8. When the Israelites came back from exile, they stood, men and women, and the children, they all stood together. And in Nehemiah 8 and verse 9, it says, All the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. It is important for children to hear what God is speaking to their parents. It is important for wives to hear what God is speaking to the husbands. Do not take lightly the teaching of God's word. It is in God's word that his will is revealed. There is no other book that we will present here to find out the will of God. If we are serious about raising up the next generation of Joshua, let this book not depart from our mouth and from our meditation do not dilute the word of God. Don't think that our children do, do not have the intelligence to understand God. Introduce them to the presence of God. Introduce them to the word of God. Teach the truth as it is. Do not take these opportunities of hearing God's word lightly. In Amos chapter 8 and verse 11, this is what the Lord says, I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for the hearing of the words of the Lord. There are people around the world who share pages from scripture because they are not allowed to hold one full Bible in their possession. Don't take for granted the voice of the Lord. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, we read this. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love 
which are in Christ Jesus. Another translation says, what you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching. The passion with which our generation honors God's word is the passion with which the next generation will receive God's word. Godly families are built around God's word. When popular culture attacks scripture, stand firm for the truth of God's word. Stand firm for the genuineness and the authority of God's word. Will we be able to say, as for me and my house, we will submit to the word of God. And the third, th third way that Mo Moses influenced Joshua was Joshua chose faith in God over strength of man. When we turn to Numbers chapter 14 and verse 1, we see Joshua's reliance on God's power. The spies have gone out and they have come back and given a negative report. All the congregation is lifting up their voices and they are crying and people are weeping. Verse 2, Numbers 14 and verse 2 says, All the sons of Israel grumbled. But Joshua tore his clothes because he knew his God. And in verse 8 he says, If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. Where did he get such faith? All those years of walking with Moses. All those years of seeing firsthand the power of God at work in his life increased his faith. Take every opportunity that we can to tell to our children that God is at work. Point out to everything that God has done in our lives and say, this happened because God did it. You see, Joshua knows that apart from God, he is a failure. Apart from God, he will not be able to accomplish anything. If you come back to Joshua 24, I want to show you how Joshua gives glory to God. As he gathers the leaders of Israel, this is how he presents the history of Israel. In Joshua 24 and verse 3, notice the personal pronoun, I. It is the Lord speaking. I took your father, Abraham. I led him. I gave him descendants, verse 4. I gave Jacob and Esau, verse 5. I sent Moses and Aaron. I plagued Egypt. I did in their midst. I brought you out. You get the picture. Israel's history is a history of God's working in their lives. But what did they do? What did the Israelites accomplish? Joshua 24 and verse 13. You did not labor. You did not build. You did not plant. And so today when we look at the stories of our lives, will we walk in humility, acknowledging that there is nothing in our lives that God didn't do for us. There is nothing in our lives that God didn't give us. If we faithfully and in humility acknowledge before our children that we did not deserve to be blessed, but that God chose to bless us because of grace, we will raise up a generation that is dependent on God. Take time to tell the next generation what grace means. What it means to receive unmerited favor from God. And God will honor that faith. This book of Joshua is about the faith that men and women placed in God. We read about Rahab. We read about the battle at Jericho. We read about Caleb and so on. Victory after victory was given because there were men and women who were ready to trust in God.
who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt, not because of who I am, but because of what you have done, not because of what I have done, but because of who you are. As for me and my house, can we say this morning, we will place our trust in God. When Joshua addresses the people, there is a reason why he's narrating Israel's history. It is to promise them that the God who brought them out of Egypt is powerful enough to sustain them in the journey if they choose to serve him. This morning, there is no mountain before you that God cannot remove. Whatever it is that you are worried about, whatever it is that is bothering you, you have come before God who split the Red Sea. You have come before God who repeated the splitting at the Jordan River. Look back to what God has done in your life. Write them down and say, God, I will trust you. I believe in your power. I will choose to serve you. You will prove yourselves to be faithful to me again. What do we have to give the next generation? What do we have to hand over to the next generation? Genuine worship of God, genuine submission to his word, and genuine faith in the power of God. I can say for sure that my passion for God was kindled by the passion that my parents had for God. But I will fail if I do not do my part in pointing my children to the God who redeemed us. A generation that seeks the presence of God, not because we told them, but because God has kindled in them a love for him. A generation that submits to God's word. They will choose to bring their Bibles and open it up, not to please us, because they want to hear God's word. A generation that will trust in God in all of their circumstances because they have tasted and seen that God is good. Is this what we want for our children for the next generation this year? Will this be one of the most important things that we will pray for? Lord, I don't want to stand before you without my children. I know that you are capable of doing that. I trust in you. I will not allow the enemy to have any part in the lives of my children. Go to the tent of meeting. Your Joshua will show up. But when Joshua presents this demand from the people, they respond and say, yes, we will serve God. In verse 18, Joshua 24 and verse 18, we read, We also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua gives them a stunning response. In verse 19, he says, You will not be able to serve the Lord. This was not the response that they were expecting. Why will they not be able to serve the Lord? The problem is not them. The problem is God. In verse 19 we read, because God is holy, because God is jealous. Serving God is not a right. Our sin has disqualified us from serving God, but our redemption has brought back that privilege of worshiping God. This book is a book 
of victories, but there are also some failures in this book. Israel failed when there was sin in the camp. God can be served only on his terms. Joshua has seen firsthand the burning of the wrath of God against Israel when Israel served or neglected the service of God. Do not take lightly this privilege of coming and serving before God. Hebrews 12 and verses 28 to 29, this is what it says. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Serving God with reverence and awe. Do not take lightly this privilege of raising the next generation. We see the evidence in this chapter that Israel did serve God. In verse 31 we read, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua. But Israel's later history is a sad history. The book of Judges is a record of the people not serving God. On this side of eternity, we may not know fully what impact our service for God had. That if the Lord tarries, that impact will be felt after we pass on. God can raise a generation of Joshua's in our midst if we are willing to pay the price. When Joshua stands up and declares, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, he is confident that his house will join with him. Men of God, do you have that confidence that when you stand up and declare, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, that your house will follow you? Women of God, do you have that willingness where you will follow spiritual leadership? This is a battle. Joshua waged an actual battle. Godly families will realize that there is a battle going on for our children. It is time that we understood the seriousness of this situation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, this is what Paul says, When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. What are the childish things before us that is preventing us from interceding for our children, that is preventing us from spending all that we have to raise up the next generation? Do not take for granted the legacy that we have received. Do not take for granted the teachings that we are receiving. Do not take any of the spiritual blessings that we have for granted. Will you close your eyes? If you are a parent, will you give thanks for your children, that God gave you those children? Will you bring them before the Lord and ask, Lord, Make him into a Joshua. Ask the Lord for grace to meet with him in your tent of meeting. God will do it. Pray that our children will be grateful for the legacy that is being handed down to them. Church member, do not take lightly these resources that God is providing us to get to know him better.
to build up godly families. None of this will happen without the grace of God, without the power of God. Gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we commit our lives before you. Even when we declare that we will serve you, Lord, we acknowledge the weakness of our flesh. So we pray that you will anoint us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and that you will bring us to the level of introducing our children to your presence, to your word. Lord, we pray that we will shed aside any propensity to be strong in ourselves, but that we will trust you, Lord. Lord, we pray for the children in this church. Lord, we pray that even as they are listening to their Sunday school teachers now, pour your spirit upon them, O Lord. Kindle in them a love for your word and for your presence, O God. Lord, we pray that they will come to us and say, show us from the scripture what God is telling you. Lord, we commit them into your hands. Lord, we pray for all our families. Lord, we commit this year into your hands, O Lord. We look forward to the Joshua's that you're going to raise up in our midst. We thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your continued grace. You are a holy God. You are a jealous God, O Lord. We fall down at your feet and worship you. In Jesus' precious name we pray.